One of the most valuable concepts emerging from psychological research is that of lifespan development. The idea that many aspects of human nature continue to develop throughout the entire life cycle. As we come to the end of our life, for example, there's what we call biological senescing, growing older physically, but also the possibility of psychological adolescing and developing psychologically to our full potential. Eric Erickson helped redirect developmental psychology toward the entire life cycle. His insights into the crises of identity came out of his own experiences as a newcomer to the United States. Because as an immigrant, I faced one of those very important redefinitions that a man has to make who lost his language, his, uh, all the, the references on the basis of which his, uh, his sensory and sensual impressions were based. When I came to Boston in 1933, psychoanalyst, that was, that was quite a new field. Freud presented a very, very important model of psychosexual development, pointing out that we have to understand uh, a good deal of man's later life in view of the way he was able to resolve conflicts in his very early life. And it certainly seems that Freud uh, did not pay an awful lot of attention beyond these first five years of life. But certainly, it seems that you try to conceptualize these later periods as well as these earlier periods in somewhat more detail. But you have added what seems to be some character dimensions that you think evolve eventually from this early level. You talk about basic trust versus basic mistrust being related to this oral sensory level. Remember here that this is not just a matter of a simple shift of focus, that one is built on the other. Now, you undoubtedly remember that what Freud first was very much concerned with was to find the experiences in life in which he could find quantities of something. So to him, the origins and the transformations of sexual energy it was not a matter of, of preoccupation with sexuality, but it seemed to him the most likely area in which you could find quantities which arise out of the body chemistry and are translated into drives. And the, the main point is that um, we later on were concerned not just with the question of uh, what does orality contribute to sexuality. What we were interested in is what um, Orality may contribute to the child's psychosocial development. In other words, the orality takes place in relationship to the mother who feeds and who reassures and who cuddles and keeps warm. What you learn first in life is to take in. But as you take in, and take in with your mouth, with your eyes, with your senses, so what seemed important was what contribution is that to psychosocial education, and there I felt that the first basic psychosocial attitude to be learned is that you can trust your mother, that she will come back and feed you. But mistrust is just as important. Mistrust is very, the ratio of trust and mistrust is our basic social attitude. We do this constantly. If we walk, if we enter somewhere, we have to differentiate now. Can we trust or mistrust? And we, mistrust meaning the recognition of danger, the anticipation of discomfort, and so on. So these two things, that these are two things, is very basic to the whole scheme. Yeah. Building on the foundation of Freud, you've introduced the important dimension of social development, as you call it, psychosocial development. Uh, it's filling in a little bit of a gap in Freud's work in the sense that he did not really develop this. Erickson identified eight stages of psychosocial development, from birth to late adulthood in which the individual is challenged by specific crises or conflicts. Each stage is defined by a developmental task. The individual must come to terms with two opposite demands, balancing or integrating them. For the young adult, the conflict is between isolation and intimacy, the ability to make a full commitment to another person. This requires accepting responsibilities and giving up some privacy and independence. Failure to resolve this developmental crisis can lead to isolation, to a lack of meaningful psychological connections with other people. Research indicates that anything which isolates us from sources of social support can leave us at risk for a number of physical and mental problems. The next crisis, and opportunity for growth, comes during the 30s and 40s. 
During midlife, people usually move beyond the focus on self to wider commitments, to family, work, and society. But for those who haven't resolved the earlier crises of identity and intimacy, there may loom ahead what's known as the midlife crisis. People in a midlife crisis are self-indulgent. They want to give up their commitments for one last fling, opting for freedom at the expense of security and responsibility to others. Erickson's eighth and final crisis comes at the end of the life course. If an individual has resolved the crises of earlier stages, he or she can look back to enjoy a sense of wholeness. But when there are too many crises unresolved, too many aspirations unfulfilled, the end is shadowed by futility, despair, and anger. 